Hi everyone, this is Melanie from North Shore College Consulting, and today I'm going to lead the Q&A. So some of you guys are posting in questions right now, and some of you already sent us some questions from before. So I'm just going to simply read them off and I will tell you our answer. If you have any questions after the session is over, please feel free to email info at nscollegeconsulting.net, and we'd be happy to help answer any questions that you have. Hopefully, some of these questions that people ask will also help answer some questions for you. Okay, I'm going to open this up now. Okay, so the first question is, how important are senior year AP scores? So, AP scores are not needed to confirm admission to a university. So your offer of admission will not be rescinded for having low scores. Um, when filling out the Common App, the Common Application will ask what AP tests that you plan or that you plan to take or that you have taken, and you can list future tests for senior year. So if you think there's a chance that you might not take the AP test, don't include it. Um, if you plan on taking it and you get a low score, you don't have to send it to the colleges. You just won't get college credit. So only present scores that will put you in the best light um, for AP scores that you've taken through freshman or for junior year. Okay, so the next question is, most of the colleges my daughter is interested in will be test optional again. She signed up to take the ACT, but what happens if she is unhappy with her scores and does not want to submit them? When do you suggest that a student should take advantage of test optional policies? Okay, so the test optional movement is still alive and well. Um, obviously, because of the pandemic, a lot of colleges went to test optional. This means that students can submit their ACT or SAT score if they want, or if they don't want to submit, they don't have to. Some colleges um, have decided to remain test optional again, like this, um, like this family um, is experiencing. And um, Basically, it, it's great for the student because really the student should only present scores that will put them in the best light, meaning they should be submitting scores if they fall into the average scores of what is typically admitted by the university. So most universities post this information. You could usually find it on the um, freshman admitted student profile or the common data set for the university, and you can see the average test scores of what is submitted. We suggest not submitting anything in the bottom 25%. It's also important, it looks like this family did check to see that their college will be test optional. Not every college has announced their test optional policies for this upcoming year. Some are in a pilot program, but definitely don't bank on your college being test optional um, just in case. So it's really important to check. Okay, so the next question is, my son is going to be a junior and can't decide if he should take the ACT, the SAT, or both. Is one test better than the other? Should he take both tests? Okay, lots of questions around testing. Okay, so first of all, the ACT and SAT hold the same weight in terms of college admissions. So not one is better than the other and all colleges will accept either test. So the two tests though differ slightly in their skills and the timing is a bit different, the questions and the styles a bit different. So many students will have a preference either to take the SAT or the ACT, and you can decide which test is best for you since not one test is better than the other and colleges accept both tests. So it's definitely good to pick one test and focus on that focus on the study strategies for that specific test. There is no need to split your time. Um, in Illinois, um, they administer the SAT. So all juniors will eventually be taking the SAT in school. But if you want, if you, if you feel you do better on the ACT, for example, then stick to that and keep studying with the ACT. Um, our biggest suggestion is take a full length official practice, SAT and ACT, and then compare your scores. 
it's really important to mimic what the actual test will be like. So make sure that you're timing yourself, make sure that you're being proctored correctly so that way you can get the true sense of which test you'd be better on. Okay, next question is, my daughter has played field hockey both in and out of school since before freshman year. She is a competitive player and takes up most of her free time year round. As a result, she hasn't had the time to do any significant community service. Will this hurt her in the admission process? Okay, so we always get lots of questions about activities and what activity looks better than the other. And the truth is you do not need to participate in any specific extracurricular activity. Obviously, every student should be doing things that they love, that they're passionate about, that they're interested about, uh, interested in, excuse me, but that does not mean they need to pick a specific activity such as community service. So community service is just one option out of many options, including getting a job, athletics, student government, fine arts, DECA. There's so many different examples. So if she is big into playing was it uh, field hockey? Sorry, I almost said lacrosse. Field hockey, excuse me. Then she should be playing field hockey. That seems like that's something that she's super passionate about, really interested in. So the really the important thing is if a student finds an activity or a couple activities that they're passionate about, that they stick with it and that they eventually can show maybe leadership in those activities throughout high school. But for example, if community service is something that she's interested in and there possibly is time, maybe she can get some players together from her team and they can do community service, but really only if she's interested in actually doing that activity. Hope that helps. Um, okay, next question. My son has zero idea what he wants to major in in college and hasn't expressed an interest in any particular area of study, which worries me. First of all, does he need to know what he wants to major in when he applies to college? Is it bad to apply undecided? Regardless, can you recommend a way to help him figure out his interests and an area or areas he might want to study? Okay, so first of all, he's not alone. Many students aren't really sure um, what they wanna major in in college. I'm not exactly sure how old this student is, but there is no harm in marking undecided on your college application. Many students do apply undecided and admission counselors know that choosing your major is a tough decision. So they're not surprised that some students just aren't sure about what they wanna study and that's completely a normal process. Um, you really don't wanna put down a major if you really don't wanna study it or you're not really sure that you wanna major in it. So admission officers expect honesty and there's no shame in being open um, that you don't know what you wanna major in. Maybe you have lots of different options going around in your head and many different interests and you're not exactly sure how to hone those interests in yet. That's completely okay. Um, however, there are some situations in which it may benefit a student to declare a major on their application. So for example, if their interested major has a specific set of courses um, from freshman year on when they're in college, it's definitely their best interest to declare, you know, uh, majors like business and engineering, for example. So if you mark that you're interested in a specific major on your application, this could allow you to begin those requirements as soon as possible. Um, also, obviously, a major can be a way to distinguish yourself and, you know, who you are as an applicant and as a student, um, but that major must be one you feel passionate about and that you have built an academic and extracurricular history around. So if your student has lots of different interests, definitely it's important to focus in on those interests and skills. So get involved in activities that relate to your interests and kind of weed out what you like, what you don't like. A lot of times students will come to us interested in a certain major, they do an activity related and they're not really interested in it anymore. So it's definitely important to explore that through extracurricular activity planning. Um, also, it's important as the parent that you kind of help and assist them 
in developing a list of hobbies and passions that covers a broad spectrum of things um, that might fit what they want to do in a future career or major. There are also um, pre-career aptitude tests and different assessments. I know we at North Shore College Consulting give our students assessments that kind of help get those gears turning into what they want to major in and what they want to do after college. But our biggest piece of advice is hone in on interests and hobbies, and then hopefully the major will come from there. Okay. So next question is, my friend told me that her daughter, who is a junior, has already filled out her entire common application. Wow, I didn't know you were allowed to do that. Should I have my daughter start filling out her application? So yes, so what's amazing about the Common App is they have a rollover process. So what that means is all the information that you import into that main section of the Common App gets rolled over and put in to the new application cycle, which opens August 1st. So students can go on and create their Common App account right now. All of our students, all of our current juniors have also done that. And they can begin to populate the information. So it's going to be information that is main demographic information, meaning your contact details, your family background, um, your educational background, where you go to high school. You can also list your testing history, um, your GPA, your activities. And all of that information will then get repopulated into the application when application season officially begins August 1st. The one thing that will not get rolled over is college specific information. So on the Common App, you can add a bunch of different colleges that you're interested in applying to. However, all the information that you fill in for those sections won't get rolled over because all that information gets updated by the college. So every year the college has different questions that they wanna ask the students. So that is why you can't fill that part out yet. But the main part you can absolutely fill out now and it won't take you that long to complete. Okay, what next question is, what should my son major in if he wants to major in pre-med? What classes should he be taking in high school? Okay, so first of all, there is no pre-med specific major. Pre-med is a track. So really you can major in whatever you want in college so long as you take and do well in medical school prereqs and can show a demonstrated interest in medicine with some kind of experience. So you can actually major in history or philosophy as a major, for instance, um, that might even make you a little bit more competitive because a lot of pre-med um, students are in the hard sciences, you know, chemistry, biology, taking a more liberal arts approach can make you stand out a little bit. But again, it's also important that you're getting experience with um, with medicine and those sciences also. So your high school classes should demonstrate an interest in the student's intended undergraduate major if he has one. That's just a general, you know, a general rule of thumb. So if he wants to be a biology major, wants to major in the hard sciences in college, which again is not necessarily um, necessary, then he should focus on taking advantage of his high school science classes and should take the most rigorous science classes he is able to successfully take. Same goes um, with math. So the pre-med track is gonna be heavy into math and sciences. So it's good to get that experience in early. Okay, so my daughter took honor Spanish to her freshman year. She's going to be a junior and is planning on taking honor Spanish for this year. She has already said that she doesn't plan to take AP Spanish her senior year. Will this be a problem on her applications? Should I try to convince her? Okay, this happens a lot with our seniors. A lot of them want to drop that foreign language. In a perfect world, you know, I four years of all five core academic classes are preferred. That's your English, your math, your science, your social studies, and your foreign language. So you don't just want to meet the minimum requirements colleges have on their websites. You should always go beyond what they're listing to be more competitive. So with that being said, you have gotten to Spanish for, um, so a lot of colleges like to see the four years of Spanish. So if she really, really doesn't want to take it, um, then definitely suggest replacing it with another core academic class. 
So she has five core academic classes senior year. So if you take out that world language, then you got to add in something else that's substantial. The biggest pet peeve that colleges have is when students want to take an easy, um, an easy senior year and drop classes. Okay, next question. My son took the ACT a couple of times, but never took it with writing. Does he need writing? Okay, so most colleges um, don't actually require the ACT writing test. There's a very, very small list of colleges that do require it. So if your student is interested in that small list of schools or the list of schools that recommend it, um, then obviously, taking the writing will be a big benefit and can't hurt. Um, you will need to double check, you know, your students list um, and their requirements. Um, in recent years, you know, many schools that previously required the writing section have opted to make it um, optional or just not even review it at all if students choose to take it. Um, this became especially true after the SAT got rid of their writing section. So, it won't ever hurt the student to take the writing on the ACT, but it's not necessary unless they plan to apply to one of the few colleges that still require it. Okay, next question is, my daughter is supposed to take linear algebra and AP Spanish language next year when she's a senior. Um, other than linear algebra, she has completed all of the math classes offered by her high school. The counselor contacted her and told her there was a scheduling conflict and there's no way for her to take both classes. What should she do? Okay. So um, because she has taken, you know, all other math classes offered by her high school, Definitely, um, we would suggest taking AP Spanish Lang and then talking to um, the counselor, the school counselor, to see if there are options to take linear algebra outside of school. Um, so a lot of times community colleges or even an online course will offer linear algebra, and that could be a good option if they want to get that extra math in, especially if they're interested in the math and science related majors, this could be a really, really good option, but it's really important to talk to a school counselor to make sure this will count as credit, make sure it shows on the transcript. Um, if she cannot take linear algebra um, outside of school, then it's definitely important that she fills in that gap with um, something substantial that will relate to her major. So kind of like I just mentioned, colleges don't like to see students take it easy senior year, which this student definitely is not, but it's definitely good to fill in those gaps with something that's substantial and will possibly related to a major or another core academic class. Okay, next question is, should my son ask his lacrosse coach to write him a letter of recommendation for his applications. So, I mean, if they have a great relationship, absolutely. Um, we always think, you know, having a coach write a letter of recommendation shows another side to the student that is outside of the classroom that could be really beneficial. Um, this would be considered though an other recommender. So it's an other recommender, um, meaning it's not an academic. So this other recommender would not replace the academic recommendation requirement. It would just be an addition. So an other recommender are basically individuals who have worked with the student outside of school and they could show different contexts, like I mentioned, to the student's hobbies, passions, and other responsibilities. So again, this cannot replace an academic recommender and not every college will um, will allow or ask for an other recommender, but it's definitely good if they, ha if they have a great relationship to have um, this letter in kind of the student's back pocket. Um, also, you never know when you're going to need an another um, recommendation that's not academic, so it's definitely good to, to ask and to have that. Okay, another question is, what is ACT super scoring? Okay, so the super score is basically keeping your best section scores um, to be used for a best overall score. So it's taking the best, um, your best score from each section and then combining it into one mega amazing score. So the ACT super score is beneficial because it takes the average of the four best subjects from each ACT test attempt and calculates a new super score. So this is obviously great. 
However, not every college will accept a super score. So before you're relying on sending a super score, you definitely have to check your college's, you know, score policies, but it's definitely great if they do accept it. Okay. Here is the next question. Oh, and this is actually our last question. Okay. What is demonstrated interest and in, does, um, I'm sorry, what does demonstrated demonstrated interest mean and does my son need to do it? If so, how? Okay, so as our North Shore College consulting students know, because they hear it from us all the time, demonstrating interest is super, super important. So it's used now a lot in college admissions um, as something that colleges use to track um, you know, how much a student likes their school and how likely they are to enroll. It's really important that, you know, colleges are a business and a lot of this has to do with money. So recruiting students is expensive and colleges want to spend their money wisely. And students that demonstrate interest are more likely to enroll than those who don't. So schools want to protect their yield. That's very important to them. And yield, if you don't know, is the percentage of students who decide to enroll at a particular college after being accepted. So the more engaged you are with a college, the more you have a chance to consider if a particular college is also a good fit for you. So it's kind of mutually beneficial. Um, colleges want to feel confident. You'll be happy when you arrive on campus and so do you. So there are so many ways to track demonstrated interest. Um, the first one is going to be to sign up for mailing lists. And this is actually the quickest and the easiest thing to do. You will go onto the college's admissions website and look for either um, request information or mailing lists. They'll be called um, different things at different universities. Maybe they'll be called the same thing, but they mean the exact same thing. So this is your first um, way to show colleges you're interested in them and also probably your first introduction to getting emails from colleges. That's basically what it means. A mailing list is an email list. Make sure to use a professional email, not your school email, to ensure that nothing gets filtered out by the university. Um, but this is your way to also, um, besides demonstrating interest, you're gonna learn things about the college that could be interesting to you. It's also important when you get those emails to open them and read emails. Um, sometimes colleges track this. It's also important to attend information sessions and tours. This could be virtual. It could be when they come to your school. Um, it's also important to attend college fairs. Again, virtual is okay. Um, emailing an admission officer is a way to demonstrate interest. Contacting faculty, sitting in on a class, engaging on social media even. Follow them on social media. Like their, you know, like a post, comment if you want. Um, some colleges offer overnight visits, um, you know, depending on the COVID uh, restrictions at the university, uh, but this is also a great way to demonstrate interest. Um, also, some colleges offer an optional essay in their applications. It's never really optional. So completing that essay definitely shows interest. Um, Alumni interviews show interest. Really any way to engage with the university, even engaging with alumni or current students, that is a way to demonstrate interest. And more and more colleges are asking for how a student demonstrates interest on the application. So it's just good to be doing that. Okay, so I think this concludes our Q&A for now. Again, if any questions um, you have start to come up, um, after this is over, please feel free to email us at info at nscollegeconsulting.net. Again, my name is Melanie, and it was so nice um, chatting with you all today, and hope to talk to you soon.